Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. In January 1988, the actions of one man would rock the comfortable neighborhood of Dana Point. Poison as a method of murder is pretty uncommon. Richard's character was extremely secretive, arrogant, paranoid. He also fit the character profile of a classic sociopath. I think he really wanted to just tear her apart for wronging him, which is how he saw it. Evil little man. The evil little man was Richard Overton. While loading the family van in the driveway of their home, 17-year-old Eric Overton could only watch on helpless as his mother, Janet, fell to the ground. Richard helped her into the bathroom, being the caring husband that he was. Janet got violently ill in the bathroom. While Janet was getting ill, Richard called 911, and the paramedics were on their way. I think uh, Janet was in the ER maybe for less than one hour, and that was when nurse Judy Claypool came out and said that, uh, Mr. Overton, yes. Mr. Overton, I'm very sorry. We did everything we could. Janet's gone. And Richard just turned his head away and started, uh, oh my God, oh my God. Eric's eyes filled with water. He just heard that he lost his mother. It was January 24, 1988. 46-year-old Janet Overton died in hospital just a short time later. Her cause of death was recorded as unknown, but her husband knew different. Poisoning is a cowardly kind of crime. It's also sadistic. You have a person who wants to commit murder, but you also have a person who's willing to watch someone suffer and die, and, and usually for a protracted period of time to poison someone to death and live in the house with them and watch them die. That is a spe that's torture. A stay-at-home mum who had recently re-entered the workforce, Janet Overton was popular in the Dana Point community. She's very uh, knowledgeable, very likable, very adaptable uh, personality. She got on the school board, uh, she ran for re-election and she got re-elected. And then from there, she was rotated into being president of the school board, which just irritated the heck out of Richard because he had a PhD in psychology and his wife was mostly a housewife who was a high school graduate. She was, I mean, in stark contrast to her husband, she was very well liked in the community. She was known as a caring woman, hard worker, no one had a, a bad thing to say about her. Janet's husband, Richard, was a computer consultant and a college lecturer. Although the couple had been married 19 years, he and his wife seemed polar opposites. Where she was friendly and approachable, he was aloof and even arrogant. People who talked to him for any length of time often later described him as, they got the feeling he always felt he was better than whoever he was talking to. And that would, that would be wearing just in casual conversation. But if you lived with someone like that, it had to have been awful. The classic sociopath is a very intelligent person. Richard's IQ was 180 with a red bullet. They're very charming. I mean, Richard was married four times, very intellectual, and he felt that because of his PhD, 
and his level of intelligence, it put him several cuts above other people. If you met him in a social situation and he felt that you were not on his intellectual level, he would walk away from you in mid-sentence. You weren't entitled to talk to him. If he was the most important person in his universe, he couldn't understand why he wasn't the most important person in his wife's. And she had to pay for that, and she did with her life. In the months leading up to her death, Janet Overton was frequently ill. One of my neighbors was a very good friend of hers and used to go over to the hospital to see Janet all the time. She was in and out of San Clemente Hospital numerous times with long illnesses, irritations to the skin, nausea, vomiting, and the uh, blood test couldn't determine anything. Each time Janet was hospitalized, she seemed to take longer to recover. Internal bleeding, violent uh, nausea, and skin irritations all over, everywhere. Uh, the ears uh, down south, and the uh, fingertips and the uh, toes. Each time it happened, it was because of the body not being able to repair itself in enough time began to weaken. Over a period of time, Janet's uh, hospital stays be became longer and she confided to some of her friends that this situation with her sicknesses wasn't going to go away. She just uh, said that the uh, sicknesses and the hospital stays were just becoming overwhelming for her. Obviously, she had no idea what was being done to her body. For doctors and police, Janet's death was at the very least strange. Although her autopsy then didn't reveal any lethal amounts of toxic substances, tissue samples were stored. Janet was cremated, her police file put away. 18 months later, Orange County police investigator Tim Carney came across it. Tim Carney got transferred from undercover narcotics to homicide. On his first day in homicide, he is shown the uh, cold case files. And the first file he pulls up is the Overton file. He opens it up. There are three or four newspaper clippings in there. And then there's the latest uh, death certificate that says pending. Carney noticed another case that had been filed. It had been investigated by retired police investigator Cliff Miller. He had been approached by a lady named Dorothy Boyer, Richard's first wife. Richard Overton and Dorothy Boyer had married in Texas before moving to California for Richard's work. The couple had four children together and eventually moved into an affluent part of Orange County. They uh, bought a house in Capistrano Beach, which Richard uh, added an addition to. He designed the addition, and he felt that the house was going to be his for the rest of his life. In the meantime, he uh, kept his freelance teaching assignments, uh, both at Cal State Long Beach and Cal State Fullerton, in computer science and psychology. His full-time job was at Autonetics, and he had a very definitive uh, scientific position, which uh, Dorothy Boyer knew nothing about. And he also was alleging to do subcontract work for the Central Intelligence Agency down in uh, Central America because he was fluent both in Russian and in Spanish. While Richard Overton was fluent in both languages, his claim to work for the CIA was a ruse. He was a bigamist. He'd been married to Dorothy Boyer for 17 years. They raised four kids together, but he met and had a child with another woman. He met and married another woman. The other woman was Caroline Draper, whom Overton married in 1966. The pair had a daughter and shared a home in the city of Orange, some 40 minutes from his home with Dorothy in Dana Point. 
He had two separate households he was keeping, and the way that he worked it was really kind of ingenious. Um, he married the second woman, Carolyn, using a co-worker's name. It's a co-worker's name to do it. And he told both wives that he had to travel for his job and that sometimes he'd have to be gone for a week or a couple weeks. He had Dorothy drive him to the, uh, Los Angeles International Airport. And then he got out of the car. He kissed Dorothy goodbye and went inside and waited for 20 minutes. Then Carolyn Draper pulled up in a car. He got in Carolyn Draper's car, and he spent uh, two weeks with her as husband and wife. And he pulled that off for, uh, I felt it was close to a year and a half. Richard's deception was uncovered when Caroline called him at work after their daughter came down with a serious case of whooping cough. In 1968, Caroline had their marriage annulled. Dorothy filed for divorce. And he blamed Dorothy for everything. He felt that the issue of a bigamous marriage wasn't that big. For one thing, I don't think he liked the fact that a woman would leave him. And secondly, she got the house in Capistrano. It was his dream home, and he was angry and bitter about that. And he had a plan for that, too. Richard just thought to himself, being the sociopath that he was, I'm going to get back at you. And the way he got back at her was poisoning her food and doctoring her uh, family milk with selenium. Selenium is a trace element, important for cell function. It can be found in minute amounts in every human body and is common in multivitamins and even baby formula. But in high doses, selenium is toxic. It causes gastrointestinal disorders, hair loss, fatigue, and neurological damage. After her divorce from Richard Overton, Dorothy Boyer began to experience a range of mystery symptoms. She became quite ill, usually only after she drank uh, coffee, tea, some beverage. And she'd have abdominal cramps and, and everything, and she'd feel very ill. And then all of a sudden, she'd feel better. And this went on literally for a couple of years. These were small doses that, over a period of time, would um, cause a lot of irritation. He not only uh, did it with the milk, he did it in her coffee can. He did it with the uh, wine that she had. Although Dorothy had custody of the children, Richard had visitation rights. A light bulb went on when he realized that Richard was coming into the house, doctoring it. not her stuff that the uh, kids were drinking, but her mother was almost poisoned too. Dorothy took her suspicions to the Orange County Sheriff's Department. But they needed evidence. She spoke to Detective Cliff Miller. He said, what you need to do is on your way home, get a can of your favorite coffee, one pound can, and take the lid off and put the plastic lid on. And with a felt tip marker, put a small mark from the plastic lid down to the seam of the coffee can. Just make it just a little mark. And then turn it around and put it on the counter where you always put it. And just leave it there for several days. After Richard comes into the house on the um, visitation, when he leaves, check to see if the two lines are lined up. If they are not lined up, that means Richard took off the plastic can and doctored the uh, coffee. At that point, do not touch the can. Get a shopping bag, move the can into the shopping bag, and bring it back to us. It will take uh, four or five days in uh, toxicology. And if we come up with something, first we have to come up with foreign substances in the coffee can. And secondly, we have to come up with Richard's fingerprints on it. Tests came up positive for both. Traces of selenium were in the coffee and Richard's fingerprints on the can. Furious, Dorothy confronted Richard and threatened to press charges. 
And he just looked at her and said, you're operating with a bunch of fantasies. I haven't done anything. And she said, yes, you have. We have fingerprints on the coffee can. We have toxic substances in the coffee, plus the wine bottles, plus the milk. Richard, it's stacked against you. I'm telling you the truth. If this goes any further, you're going to be doing time in prison. And she got up and walked away. Richard sat there and ordered his lunch. In the end, Dorothy agreed not to press charges as long as the poisoning stopped and he sought help. Moving on with his life, Richard married for a third time, this time to Janet. Dorothy had the guilt for not pressing charges uh, for the rest of her life. Once they had Dorothy's story, then it was like, okay, maybe this wasn't a natural death at all. And they started looking at him hard for this. A re-examination of Janet Overton's tissue samples involving international toxicologists revealed traces of cyanide. Richard had been stealing vials of it from the garage of a business partner with mining interests. Tim Carney and his partner began exploring the Overton's relationship. They soon learned the marriage was not what it seemed. It was a troubled marriage. Separate bedrooms, separate meals. They were even arguing about who is going to um, fix the latest thing wrong with the refrigerator. In and out, back and forth, uh, husband came in, wife came in, nobody was speaking to each other, back and forth, and the tension just rose. Eric grew up in that type of environment. It looked, superficially looked pretty good on the outside, looking in, but then they started hearing things like they, they don't sleep together anymore. They haven't, you know, they haven't been intimate in quite a while. She was having an affair. And then they start to look at jealousy as the motive. One day, Carney spoke with Janet and Richard's son, Eric. He had two or three uh, introductory questions. And finally, with the fourth or fifth questions, he said to Eric, you know, blood being thicker than water, Eric, do you think that your father killed your mother? And Eric paused, he looked away, and he looked back at Tim, and he said, yeah, he could have. And right then and there, Tim knew instinctively a son saying this about his own father. He felt that he had something there. Well, finally, they feel like they have enough circumstantial evidence to get a warrant to search his house, and that's when they hit the jackpot. And at that point, uh, they went to Richard's house cold right in with the search warrant and confiscated uh, 40 bound journals in Richard's minuscule handwriting and 132 floppy disks that Richard was keeping over a period of years. Richard thought he had deleted the compromising material. But one of the disks contained a copy of Richard Overton's personal diary. It became another key piece of evidence. He didn't realize that uh, in the floppy disk days, even though you can delete it, it's still on the file. And with that, uh, with the, they had a data recovery company up in San Francisco who got in and were able not only to get into the various files, but Richard sometimes, he had his own encryption system. Since he was fluent in Russian and in Spanish, what he would do, he would put his initial thoughts down in Spanish, then go over and encrypt that into Russian, then erase the English part of it. That's how secretive and paranoid he was. And in this diary was every single bit of animosity and venom that he felt towards his deceased wife. He went into great and gory detail about her alleged by him affairs in meticulous detail. He recorded everything. He even recorded 
the deleterious effect that his crumbling marriage was having on his bowel movements, which is way too much information for people. But he did this all, and this was just like a roadmap for detectives about how he felt, you know, and, and how he would, you know, and why he killed her. He was consumed with jealousy. Richard's diary revealed that he had been slowly poisoning Janet with selenium long before he administered the lethal dose of cyanide. He mixed selenium with cyanide to slow down the process of cyanide. The purpose of cyanide is, once it gets into your system in whatever dose, it will slowly go up through the bloodstream to the brain. And just like Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, it will shut down the brain. He didn't use a single poison. He used them in combination, and he used them in different ways. He put cyanide, because usually when you think someone's poisoning you, they're probably gonna put it in your food or drink, and he did that. But then he also used selenium, and he put it in her mascara. The effects on her were devastating. Both of those are just awful, awful poisons. He was putting it in a cosmetic that his wife used to beautify herself presumably for another man she was having an affair. So not only was that a cowardly thing to do, it was really an overt act, like I'm gonna sabotage this, I'm gonna sabotage your, you know, your looks. But he chose to poison a cosmetic as well as anything she'd be ingesting. Really interesting and totally diabolical. And I think he enjoyed it. I think poisoners do. He had to watch his wife suffer, physically tormented daily. Sometimes her clothing, because she was so sensitive from the poisons, her clothing, just the feel of it, just the weight of it on her skin was excruciating for her. He had to be willing to watch that. Not only was he willing, I think he was quite enjoying himself the whole time. He was punishing her for her infidelity. He was punishing her for that. In his diary, Overton listed 17 men with whom he suspected Janet of having an affair and made references to what he called her seduction gear that included condoms and sex aids. He has 17 people in mind that she's having. This is ridiculous. No one has that much time in their day to conduct 17 affairs. She was having an affair, not 17. Richard Overton was indicted on October 1st, 1991, and charged with the first degree murder of his wife, Janet Overton. His trial began on June 9, the following year. Seven weeks later, it was declared a mistrial. On July 23rd, 1992, Overton was taken to hospital. Chest pains, nausea, but he was only in the hospital overnight and they release him. The trial runs into another major snag. His lawyer says that he has depression and not just depression like it's a bad day. Or, no, 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 no. He had like clinical depression. And he went in and his psychiatrist said, there's no way that you can handle this trial for at least another six months. The judge finally has to pull the plug on it and declare a mistrial. There's no way that a jury in a murder case like this can retain everything. And they just can't pick it up, you know, again. It wasn't fair to anyone. It wasn't fair to the jurors, not, you know, not to anyone. Three years later, on March 28, 1995, Overton's retrial began. His new lawyer argued that Janet Overton had died of natural causes, citing her protracted illness as evidence of this. People do not generally go to the doctor 60 times in a year. That to me says she was being poisoned. She's at the doctor 60 times. But no, that's not how the defense played it. They played it that she had another ailment, then that her death was ultimately caused by some of the medication she was taking. 
No, she was taking poison administered by her husband. That's what killed her. And that's ultimately the conclusion the jury came to as well. But the prosecution had their star witness, Dorothy Boyer. Tim always felt that if there was a real hero in this uh, case, it was Dorothy Boyer. Her testimony was damning. On May 8, 1995, the jury deliberated for just six hours before delivering their verdict. Richard Overton was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life without parole. It had a profound effect on the Dana Point community. Dorothy Boyer died in 1999 of lymphoma, likely caused by her prolonged exposure to selenium. A decade later, Richard Overton died in a prison hospice from diabetes and advanced dementia. He was 81. To me, it's kind of ironic that this man who placed so much importance on his intellect and was so arrogant about it, I think it's the arrogance that is, is so appalling, but it's ironic to me that what he died of or uh, he had dementia. So his, his brilliance, his brain was, it wasn't worth anything to him at the end. Janet's son, Eric, meanwhile, has quietly moved on with his life, determined to put those sinister events behind him. When friends of North Carolina turkey farmer Dorian Lanier discovered the truth of his agonizing death, they couldn't believe it had taken his wife Pamela 10 weeks to call 911. Fifty-six year old Dorian Lanier was a farmer from Duplin County. North Carolina. Relatives had established themselves in the area generations ago. So you have all types of agriculture that goes on there. People grow tobacco, some cotton, but there's also a bit of uh, farming relative to cattle, turkeys, this sort of thing. Born in November 1955, Pamela Jeanette Saunders had already been married three times by the time she met Dorian. Her fourth husband's passing had left her a widow for the second time. In December 1993, Dorian and Pamela tied the knot and settled down in rural Chincapin. He marries Pamela Lanier. She moves in the farm with him. They get along fine for a couple, three years. Everything's cruising along hunky-dory. But three years into their marriage, the couple were hit by a terrible event. On December 10th, 1996, Dorian was working on the property of his longtime friend, Jackie Hatcher, when Pamela called. Unfortunately, a few years into the marriage, uh, Dorian's house actually caught a fire and burned down, taking everything uh, that uh, Pamela and Dorian had worked hard to build together. Although the loss of their home was a shocking blow, the insurance payout enabled Dorian and Pamela to start afresh. He recovered about $125,000 in property insurance uh, from the fire. As a result of this event, they were actually able, through tragedy, to realize a, a dream that Dorian had had for years and years, and that was to start his own turkey farm. He grew turkeys for one of the big turkey processing production companies. 
that operates down in that part of the state. Multiple agents were administered uh, to these turkeys to make them grow, one in particular that's called Nitro-3. The problem with Nitro-3 is that it contains arsenic. Arsenic makes up part of the active ingredient in Nitro-3 called roxazone. It's mixed along with their drinking water. So if they have the little troughs that the turkeys come in and ingest water out of, it's absorbed in trace amounts directly into their system and processed. And again, this goes to the end product, which you want large, plump turkey breasts in order to facilitate sale. The arsenic can actually interact with a hormone production, and it triggers this hormone production. Thus, as the turkeys take it on in their drinking water, it causes them to grow exponentially. The couple seemed content as they worked on turning their fortunes around. But less than a year later, their happiness would be blighted again by another freak accident this time involving a bulldozer. Dorian had to remain busy all the time in the field adjacent to the area where the turkeys were, and he sustained a pretty nasty injury to his leg along the way, uh, literally lacerating it on the side of a piece of equipment. It's at this point in time that Pamela took it upon herself to treat Dorian in her own way. Dorian had a notorious reticence of doctor visits and staved off an appointment for days after his incident. Dorian, who was never too fond of going to doctors, uh, starts being exclusively attended to by his loving wife, Pamela Lanier. She took him to the home, uh, propped him up in bed, and began to dress his injuries and feed him there. Dorian's recovery was very, very slow. Dorian's recovery wasn't just slow. It was noticeably secluded. Very few people have contact with him at this point. She keeps them away. And when people contact her and reach out to her to want to inquire about Dorian's condition, she'll say that he doesn't want to be bothered. He's sick and he's in bed and we're taking care of him. The problem is, is that Dorian was not healing as well as one might think over a period of time. All of a sudden, Dorian Lanier starts coming down with the classic symptoms of poisoning. I mean, he's got flu-like symptoms all the time. The poison in question was arsenic. Cases like this keep cropping up in North Carolina, particularly arsenic poisoning. Well, number one, there's a lot of arsenic around here or there used to be. Arsenic is endemic to rural activities, farming, food production of all kinds, all kinds of stuff that involve rural or agrarian societies. I mean, you gotta get rid of pests, you gotta get rid of, of vermin, and arsenic, very effective at doing all that. So it's readily available. Witnesses, including, I think, uh, close relatives, had witnessed Dorian drinking directly from uh, the water supply system that fed the turkey's hydration system that contained uh, the Nitro-3. Dorian saw his doctor on September 14th and complained of a bitter taste in his mouth. In a follow-up consultation two weeks later, the doctor found him delirious and sick. Dorian was bedridden for an extended period of time, and during this period of time, he experienced hallucinations, slipping in and out of coma, along with his jaundice condition, uh, stemming from uh, hepatic failure or liver failure. Uh, his life was absolutely miserable. To ease her husband's pain, Pamela resorted to giving Dorian a painkiller she was well acquainted with. In 1997, Pamela had been diagnosed uh, with uh, uh, migraine headaches. She had developed uh, also some sores on her body as well. 
Pamela had developed quite the addiction to pain medication. As a matter of fact, it was determined later that uh, Pamela had uh, run up a debt of almost $10,000 uh, so that she could uh, acquire prescriptions for a painkiller. With a glaring bill escalating at the local Keenansville drugstore and with no medical insurance to cover the costs, Pamela was under pressure to pay up. Pamela began to have to doctor shop to go about trying to get more of these drugs. Despite Pamela's attempt at treatment, Dorian's condition was getting worse. She covers his bed in a tarp, like you get from the hardware store, so that when Dorian throws up, when he has explosive diarrhea, when he gets in a really bad way, she can just kind of take the mattress outside and hose it off. He was laying in a state of filth, and so this tarp had been placed beneath his body to contain uh, all of this waste product that was being produced by him at this point in time. Again, this is another indication of the impact uh, that being administered this nitro-3 compound into a system that contained arsenic uh, was having on his body. Enduring terrible pain, and now cognitively impaired, Dorian didn't see his own doctor for another two months. On November 17, 1997, he was back in hospital with nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. He's got gastrointestinal distress. He's got, you know, heart problems with his heart. Because the arsenic is literally processed through the liver, it has a tremendous effect on the chemical balance within the digestive tract, as say we're, for instance, processing food as waste products as it's going through. Because of this imbalance relative to the arsenic present in the liver and that's transferred over into the gastrointestinal tract, you'll have things like chronic diarrhea, you'll have bloody stool, uh, and then on the other end, you will have highly irritated esophageal problems where you will literally have individuals vomiting blood. Despite his critical condition, Pamela took Dorian back home. On November 19th, family friend Jackie Hatcher paid a visit. Dorian's skin literally began to change color. Starting in the abdominal area, he became uh, yellow in color, and this is tied back to what we refer to as a condition of jaundice. Alarmed at his friend's condition, Hatcher told Lanier to call for an ambulance immediately. Soon after Dorian arrived at the hospital at 6.25 that evening, he was violently vomiting, bringing up undigested food and red fluid. One of the reasons that you'll have this horrible outcome with arsenic is that it is literally a caustic substance. It could be compared, uh, say for instance, a, a caustic ingestion of something like an acid, uh, for instance, because of the imbalance at a chemical level. It creates an imbalance within the gastrointestinal lining where the actual lining itself becomes highly irritated. An individual is in, incapable of processing food appropriately. By 11 o'clock that night, 56-year-old Dorian Lanier was dead. In most locations, if an individual arrives at a hospital unconscious and dies within 24 hours of admission, automatically this case is reportable to the medical examiner or the coroner. And in Dorian's case, it was. Further investigation along with the autopsy results indicated that he had heavy metal poisoning, specifically arsenic in his system. The police and the State Bureau of Investigation started investigating, mainly at the behest of Dorian's family because they, you know, they don't understand what's happened to him. In particular, Dorian's family wanted to understand how so much arsenic had ended up in his body. A clue was right there on the farm. So if you were to administer pure nitro-3 uh, to a human being, say for instance, if you just completely laced their food with a massive dosage of it, death would be very sudden. 
But if the nitro 30 is administered over a long protracted period of time, uh, you'll see the individual becoming progressively more and more ill. You'll have things that will occur like skin color changes, jaundice because it begins to affect the liver, hallucinations, and terrible gastrointestinal problems as well. Visitors to the Lanier's farm had seen Dorian sipping from the turkey's water supply. Some people put forth the theory that uh, Dorian was not dosed uh, by Pamela, but by himself over a protracted period of time. Could Dorian have been unwittingly poisoning himself by drinking from the arsenic-dosed water hose? It was plausible, but when police began digging into Pamela's past, they became doubtful. During the process of the investigation, they discovered that Pamela had actually been involved in an earlier case, in an earlier relationship, had drowned down at the North Carolina coast in the Sound. That relationship was with Johnny Ray Williams. In 1989, Pamela and Johnny Ray married and settled in Surf City on Topsail Island by North Carolina's coast. While Pamela manned a surf shop, Johnny Ray worked at a fishing tackle store. A keen fisherman himself, he had crab pots in the intercoastal waterway behind their mobile home. On August 20th, 1991, Johnny Ray, a heavy drinker and smoker, was admitted to hospital feeling confused and unable to speak clearly. Two weeks later, on September 4th, he received medications after a follow-up visit. Late that night, before turning in, he decided to check on his crab pots outside their trailer but he didn't come back. Pamela and Johnny didn't own a phone, so she ran to her neighbor's home, begging them to call 911. When Johnny Williams was found deceased, uh, he was found floating in only three or four feet of water. Uh, Pamela had put forth that he had drank copious amounts of alcohol that night, in addition to have taken uh, Benadryl, his death was initially thought to be an accidental drowning. No autopsy was performed. It's often the case with drownings. Uh, no autopsy, usually because there's not one needed. I mean, drowning's pretty evident as far as the cause of death. They were in deep financial trouble. As a matter of fact, they had a rather large piece of property that was about to be foreclosed on. When Johnny died, that property was left in entirety to Pamela. In addition, Pamela got almost $24,000 in insurance policy money. Duplin County investigators thought two husbands dying from two accidental deaths was too much of a coincidence. What's particularly interesting about Johnny's death is that Johnny had worked and lived around the water for his entire life. He was found immediately adjacent to the dock in only three to four feet of water. It's been said that Johnny was an excellent swimmer. So this gave an indication to the DA at that point in time that maybe there was more to Johnny's death. Duplin investigators noticed another parallel. In the end, uh, she stood to gain quite a bit of money as a result of the death of Dorian. Selling Dorian's bulldozer and tractors accrued Pamela over $21,000 while an option to purchase Dorian's farm in Duplin County earned her nearly a quarter of a million dollars. In addition to an addiction that Pamela had developed for prescription medication, it would appear that Pamela developed an addiction to money as well. Duplin County investigators thought as much, and in January 1999, charges were filed against Pamela for first-degree murder. Almost three years after Dorian's passing, 
the trial went to court. In a rare decision, the court allowed the prosecution to present the circumstances of Johnny Ray Williams' death to support their murder charge against Pamela. It was a motion known as the Doctrine of Chances. She had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to ply him with this nitro-3 compound, which contained arsenic in not just the water he drank, but potentially in the food that he consumed as well. The prosecution's use of the Doctrine of Chances helped to seal Pamela's fate. And on November 29, 2001, the jury found her guilty. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. She's sitting in prison, doing life in prison, North Carolina Correctional System. Dorian, meanwhile, rests in Duplin County among his ancestors in the family cemetery. 